it's not automatic for the president to have power. He's got to fight for it. This is an oligarchy, right? In the 9-11 era, you know, 10 years ago, I hope we made the point that there is this invisible government, parallel government, uh, uh, deep state, whatever you want to call it. It's largely the projection of Wall Street power into the Washington government with uh, private networks that are loyal to Wall Street and not to the Constitution. So you got to take that on. And uh, I, I, I would say, uh, look, Obama, right? You want to see some targeting. Um, when you had all those people running across the White House lawn or a, uh, an unknown person with a gun in the same elevator with Obama or the guy running up the front uh, steps of the uh, of the White House. You have to ask yourself, what is that? Those are warnings. That's the invisible government talking to Obama, you know, reminding him we're all around you. And what they seem to want at this point is the bombing of Syria. They want to bomb Assad. Uh, and that's the particular combination of this guy, General Allen, the ISIS czar inside the government, and his uh, backup outside the government is his his twin, General David Petraeus, the former head of the uh, CIA. And it gets you down to things like, um, what was Benghazi, right? The, uh, the right-wingers have been talking about Benghazi, right? This was a terrible thing. They want to blame that on Obama. That's ridiculous. Uh, Benghazi in September of 2012, right, right before the November 2012 presidential election, that was an attempted October surprise, except it was an October surprise in the era of early voting. So if you want to have your October surprise these days, you got to have it in September. And sure enough, they had it on September 11th. So you have this attack by groups in Libya that are uh, traditionally CIA assets. So they start attacking this compound uh, with Ambassador Stevens and some other State Department people in it in Benghazi, Libya. And uh, the question then is, why are there no aircraft? Why, why don't uh, the special forces or something intervene? Uh, it is not the case that air, air bases are very far away. There's a base on the island of Sicily, Sigonella. It's a very famous one. Uh, it's about an hour and a half away, maybe an hour away from from the coast of uh, Libya. So they, they could have had airplanes in there. Uh, and, of course, that could have been accompanied by other other forces. And they were uh, there was a group of heavily armed CIA paramilitaries at a safe house about a mile away from Benghazi. So the question would be, General David Petraeus, head of the CIA, why didn't you order forces to intervene? Did you order them to stand down? And they probably did. And then the question would be to General Carter Ham at that point, the head of the U.S. African Command, who controls that base in Sicily, why didn't you do something about that? So what you're left with is the idea that this was supposed to be the downfall of Obama and the installation of Mitt Romney as president. And I have to argue that uh, under Mitt Romney, we'd be much worse off. We'd probably already be at war with uh, Russia right now, and that would be a very bad uh, outcome. And I would also add that the the, the pressure from the invisible government on Obama involves they want the bombing of Syria. There's a, there's a group in the ruling class that says, bomb Syria and you'll be bombing Russia at the same time so you can get the back door to a war with Russia by bombing Syria. And they seem to want this. And then there are others who say, confront uh, Putin directly in uh, Ukraine. And I would have to argue to everybody, this is incalculable folly. There is no vital U.S. interest in Ukraine, uh, quite the opposite, right? The people that have taken power in Ukraine seem to represent the continuation of the, uh, the, the, the institutions of the people who prospered under the Nazi occupation back during World War II, centered in the town of Lvov or Lemberg or whatever you want to call it in the uh, western uh, part of Ukraine. That's who's in charge now. Um, this is not a good group. You don't want to support them. And above all, the American people cannot stand a useless, futile, suicidal war with Russia, of all things, uh, in, in a place like uh, Ukraine. In other words, this is, uh, this is getting close to, uh, well, to, to a, a catastrophe. You can see the writing on the wall. Now, Obama you know, has been worn down. Uh, they want him to provide 
sophisticated weapons to Ukraine. This is absolute folly. Uh, the people in Ukraine uh, are not trained to use them. And what they'll probably do is sell them to somebody in the Middle East, and then you'll, you'll see them coming back again. So the, the point is a negotiated solution, a political solution is indispensable. And the way you get that is to say to Russia, fine, we recognize that you have a sphere of interest around your borders, that you don't want hostile states on your borders. It's an old Russian demand, right? Ukraine and, and indeed Belarus would be the classic avenues of invasion, right? From Napoleon to the Swedes in the, in the previous century, right? Down to the, the tragedies of, uh, of the 1940s. Uh, Russia, you have uh, a, a good case. You should have, you should be free from actively hostile states in your own area. The U.S., of course, does the same thing. So why not Russia too? And that means no NATO membership for Ukraine. Indeed, as we talked about before, better to break up NATO completely. This is now uh, far beyond any any useful life. But if you can't do that, at least don't have Ukraine join uh, NATO. So right. So so uh, recognize that there is a vital Russian interest in these areas. And these two points, Syria and Ukraine seem to be the two uh, obsessions of a, of a part of that ruling class that I was describing before. In other words, people who are um, mentally unbalanced, incapable of uh, calculating the results of what they recommend, sociopaths, uh, and so forth. So once again, we look forward to the 2016 presidential election. Now, the president is not automatically in the ruling class by any stretch, as I've been as I've been arguing, but if you don't want to have a choice between Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush or something like this, or worse, Hillary Clinton or the union-busting Governor Walker of Wisconsin, well, then you uh, you better get busy and create some kind of an alternative now in advance. So that was the idea of this course, right, to try to, to, try to get people uh, thinking in that, that direction and, above all, the program that it would take. You mentioned to me that there's a city in Ukraine that is now encircled by what? Ukrainian citizens of Russian descent? What is going on there? This is uh, the, the reason why we have this hysteria in Washington that you've got to send sophisticated weapons to the Ukrainian army and it's got to be done immediately, right? The Republicans have thrown off as we knew they would, right? The Republicans have thrown off this mantle of isolationism, and they're back as the war party, right, with a vengeance. Uh, uh, the libertarians uh, have either capitulated or been pushed aside, so now it's the Republican war party, and um, unfortunately there's a, a large war party on the side of the uh, of the Democrats. So here's what it is. It's a place called... Debaltsev, I'm, I'm not sure the pronunciation of this, but D-E-B-A-L-T-S-E-V-E. -E -E. This is a town in Ukraine, and it is held by about 8,000 pro-Kiev forces, right, representing the post-coup government, right? There was a coup there about a year ago, and this is now the second generation. Elections held under that coup government, right, the, the current... Uh, uh, ahead of it, right, the chocolate king, Poroshenko, or as I call him, Porno-shenko. Uh, Debaltsev is now garrisoned by 8,000 pro-Kiev fighters, but they're surrounded. They're encircled by pro-Russian forces, and this is going to play out now. And I'm sure, I suspect, there's somebody like Susan Rice or maybe General Allen or maybe General Petraeus who are arguing for an immediate U.S. military intervention to try to save these uh, pro-Kiev fighters, right? A lot of them are militias, right? A lot of them are the right sector. A lot of them are these people who trace their their lineage back to Stepan Bandera, who is one of the figures under the uh, under the German rule there in the in the in the Second World War. So Debaltsev is uh, it's like a salient, and it's being cut off. And these forces are now pocketed, and they're, they're then going to be uh, captured and rounded up. Uh, there's no way that uh, some, you know, anti-tank missiles could could change this. But uh, this is the thing that has stimulated the, uh, the, the the war party in Washington into extreme hysterics. So uh, again, I would uh, 
urge everybody, the watchword is not one soldier, not one penny for this uh, Ukrainian government. They are not an ally of the United States. They've never been. Uh, and it, it would simply be, it would be insane. It would be, you know, lunacy to take on a commitment by the United States to defend that group of provocateurs and hotheads and extremists in Kiev, this makes absolutely no sense. Uh, much better to simply make a rational uh, accord, right? A modus vivendi, a deal with uh, with Putin that simply says, look, uh, we understand that because of your experiences, right, you've been invaded by Sweden, by Napoleon, by Germany, and others, always across those territories, you have a good reason to want them not to be actively hostile. That's all they ask, right? Not to be members of NATO and not to, not, not to have a political life which is dominated by the hatred of Russia, which is unfortunately what you have in Ukraine these days. So that's, that, I regard that as a vital interest of the, uh, of the United States. And of course, the relation of all this to, um, to the political economy of the American system is what we learned in Vietnam and then what we learned again in, in uh, the post-9-11 era, is that once you have a foreign war going on, your entire social reform agenda, your entire human development agenda, your capital investment in urban mass transit or health care or housing, that all goes out the window, right? You, <laughs> I have to refer to the title of your, your program, right? Uh, L- Lyndon B. Johnson promised guns and butter, and it turned out that he couldn't do it. It was only guns, and that then was the, 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 the collapse, ultimately, of the great society and the anti-poverty program was not because they didn't work, but just once the, once the guns began to shoot, the money was all sucked up into the uh, Vietnam War, and the, the programs were underfunded. So we cannot do this again. Right? The, the, the struggle against foreign wars is the struggle against austerity and, uh, and vice versa.